am I? I can't... I can't see. There's a light. A, a ridge of some sort. What... what is that sound? What is this place? The lake... of fire? Bodies writhe in pain, being burned alive. Death will bring relief, but here, here, there is no death. There is no death. Their bodies burn and burn and burn, and yet their flesh is not consumed. It is an endless. Eternal torture! <laughs> There's something gripping my spine. Something shoving me. A force. No! Pushing me forward! I can't! No! Please! I can't turn around! To run! No, no! I will not go! I will not go! No! I will! That's... that's what I saw. The chasm. Yes, Lydia. Also known as the Pit of Gehenna. The Lake of Fire. Reserved for all who rejected the Lamb of God. Including all the fallen angels. Demons. For all who are there, there is no turning away. No end. Ever. So I looked into the very place where Pastor Allen... Yes. Why did I weigh such cheap, shallow teaching? Why was I so proud? It was a simple truth. Why didn't I listen to his voice? My own pride. Why did I turn away from him? I missed it. Why did I reject his truth? A fool. Why did I reject his love? A wretched, despicable fool. Why did I reject him? Why? <laughs> the angel! Oh, please! Alan! Please! Take my hand! Oh, please, thank you! Thank you! <laughs> What you have been through is real. If you lost your earthly life at this moment in time, this would have been your eternal destiny. What do you mean, if I lost my earthly life? The Father allowed you to see what would have happened if your son was not, at this very moment, rescuing you from death. Jeff! Because of your son's persistence and obedience to the urging of the Spirit, you are about to be spared. You see, Alan, the Father is going to allow you to deliver a message to the world. He is granting you a second chance. And then, just at that moment, Life, faint and distant, flowing into me. It was the oxygen Jeff had just released into the submarine. My courageous son. I've come back into this body with the taste and the crush of that horrific despair. It still lingers like a shadow on my mind and my spirit. Outside the window, 
Oh, my dear son. He's warning me that I'm running out of air. He doesn't want me to speak. But what I have to tell you, my dear church, is so much more important. I must tell you this awful thing that I've seen. And I must ask you for your forgiveness. I have preached a false gospel to you. A twisted truth that focuses almost exclusively on grace. Not the real thing, but a cheap, easy grace. One that glosses over whether we're truly walking with God. A cheap grace that shrugs off the fear of God. That forgets His righteousness. That disregards His call for us to be whole. Truly holy. But more than anything, this cheap grace I preach to you ignores the reality of eternity, of heaven and hell and righteousness. Because the judgment is real. So very real. I know that now. I must repent of one last thing. My divorce and remarriage. It is clear to me now that I destroyed my marriage in an act of selfish rebellion and adultery. And then I tried to justify it to my church. This was an abomination to God. I repent. I repent before all of you. I beg your forgiveness. Please, God. Please, church. Please, forgive me. And redeem my death by making sure you don't suffer the fate I did. Please, please pray with me. Friends, let's get on our knees and ask forgiveness. Dear God, you're, you're here. Dad, what are you doing? What is so important that you have to say it now? Dear God, I beg your forgiveness for my sin, my rebellion, my pride. Please redeem these last few moments my dear son Jeff has given us. And Lord Jesus, Enter our hearts, dwell in us, and make us your own. Your will be done. We want to know you. Take us, Lord. No. No! God, I still gotta have your help. Dad still needs saving here. Please give me a miracle, an idea, something. Anything! The safety manual. Oh, think back, Jeff. There was another kind of valve, some some kind of a ballast. Or, it was right along here somewhere in that picture. Huh? Ah, gotta get debris off. Oh, there. Emergency oxygen ballast vent. Alright, if this works right, it would send the sub straight to the surface. Yes! Huh. Uh. Come on now! Stupid valve! Uh. A little more! Uh. Uh -oh. uh. Hold on, Jeff! Yes! Yeah!
Thank you, God. Okay, it's time to get Dad. Where, where's the hatch? Here we go. Dad? Dad? Oh, Hal oh, Newman. Carrie Knowles. Jenny. Oh. Dad! Yeah? Dad, I'm yeah. here. It's me, Jeff. We're, we're on the surface now. Oh, uh, Jeff. Yeah, Dad, we have to get you to a doctor. You did me proud today, son. So did you, Dad. But please, please hang on, okay? Jeff. Jeff, promise me you won't ignore what I told them today. Promise. Yeah. Yeah. Dad, I promise. I promise. I can see them, son. No. I can see them coming for no. me. No. Oh. Oh, Dad. <laughs> And so everyone on the submarine... Every one of them lost their earthly lives that day. Hal Newman entered eternity and continues to suffer torment beyond imagination. The chasm. And the others? Carrie Knowles is there now as well. How could these people spend so long in the house of God and yet miss him? It is hard to fathom, I know. The greatest of heartbreaks occurred time and time again before the great white throne. Many people who called themselves Christian turned out to be a Christian in name only. They pursued a walk with religious busyness, but they missed a genuine walk with God. Was that a hard thing to do? To walk with God? You don't remember because you died soon after you were saved. But here's the saddest part, Lydia. A walk with God wasn't easy, but it was simple. To walk with God, people had to first humble themselves, to be genuinely sorry for breaking His laws. But once they sincerely submitted themselves to the Lordship of Jesus, He Himself would come into a person's heart and free that person from the bondage of darkness. And His love would transform that person's life from the inside out. That was the walk. But many chose instead to substitute a walk with religious activity. They neglected a true walk with him. So the chasm back there, is that some kind of warning or reminder? Exactly. God placed it there to warn his people and his angels. It was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah at the close of his book. But why would God need to warn in such a perfect place as this? Because when God's own mighty angel Lucifer rebelled, there was no precedent for it. It was a rebellion born in a perfect heaven. So our Lord, out of his love for us, allows this window into horror, even here, to remind us what happens to those who turn against him. None of us should ever forget. Now I'm beginning to see. Just beginning. So what happened to the others? The ones in your story? Well, Norm Knowles, despite his sins and his shortcomings, had a repentant heart. He walked with God. And so he continues his walk with God today, here in New Jerusalem. What about Jenny? Jenny Rockaway's sin destroyed a marriage, but during her final moments on the submarine, she repented and asked God to forgive her. When she was called before the White Throne, her name was found in the Book of Life. And so, she was taken up to be with the Lord. Oh, what about the older lady? 
The one Pastor Allen had trouble remembering. Velma, yes. Velma Epperson. On Earth, Velma volunteered faithfully for 32 years in the church nursery. But she never complained and never called attention to herself. When she entered the great hall of the White Throne... Oh, my! Oh, this is such a, a, a beautiful... Wonderful place! Oh, 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 yay, yay! <laughs> Who are we applauding? <laughs> My dear daughter. Lord? We are applauding you, my dear. <gasps> what? Velma Epperson. Oh. Come, come, take your place now. You have been my faithful servant. Well done! And now I am pleased to appoint you as a regional governor. Oh. <laughs> oh, my. Oh. Welcome, welcome, child. <laughs> That's wonderful. But what about the people back at the church? Ah, now that is the best part of the story. This is GNN Breaking News, Tragedy in the Caribbean. The final hours of a pastor and his people aboard a submarine. Recovery efforts are underway at this very moment. The Port Authority in Barbados reports that there are circumstances... A remarkable unfolding of events, including Pastor Alan Rockaway's last sermon to his church. Capped by a dramatic retelling of an unusual death experience. We have reporters on standby now at the scene. And here at Summit Chapel in Denver, church members started an all-night prayer vigil that continues to grow every hour. It's doubled in size since this morning. And all this after the news of Pastor Alan Rockaway's death. I talked to church members who were dramatically affected by the events of today. Church, God is here with us in a way I haven't felt in a long time. And we're going to stay right here on our faces before him until he's through with us. Um, Pastor Larry? Yes. I don't want to interrupt what's going on here, but I need somebody to talk to. What's your name, sweetheart? Kathy. I'm not a member of your church or anything. That's okay. I'm a party girl, all right? Not a church girl. Church girls used to make fun of me. I only came here because my friend forced me to. But when I heard Pastor Allen, it really messed me up. It messed up a lot of us. You don't understand. I'm a bad girl. Really bad. I did drugs when I was pregnant. I know. It's awful. My boyfriend left me. My whole world was crashing in. I wanted to escape so bad. And do you know what happened, Pastor Larry? I lost a beautiful little baby boy. I killed him. It was exactly one year ago tonight. And I told myself today, I'm not going one more day with this guilt trip on me. It's time for me to just check out of life, you know? Kathy. I don't want your sugar sweet, God loves you stuff. I... I need God. I need him to forgive me. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is so inappropriate. Kathy, don't you dare apologize. Hey, let me tell you something. You are a godsend to this church. We haven't had an altar call in... I, I... I can't remember when. But that's going to change. And it's going to change right now. And we are going to start right here. I'm going to get on my knees with you. And you and I are going to go to God together. All right? <laughs> All right. Give me your hand. Kathy Mingus became the very first salvation in a great spiritual awakening that became known as the Great Return. Yes, I've heard of the Great Return. I'm sure you have. It all started at Summit Chapel. That night, 
Pastor Allen's congregation finally came to know the healthy balance between the love of God and the fear of God. And hundreds of people came to God as a result. Later, as they stood before the great white throne, they were spared the horror of hearing the word, depart. And you'll never believe what happened to Terry Rockaway. She married again? Later she did, yes. But I'm referring to the powerful calling God gave her right after these events. Soon, Terry and Jeff were getting invitations to share their amazing story all over the country. Before long, they were speaking all over the world. Please welcome our very special guests, Terry and Jeff Rockaway. Meanwhile, Jeff became pastor of Summit Chapel, married a beautiful girl named Sharon, and became a dad to three great kids. He and Terry went on to become some of the most powerful voices in the Great Return. And with me today is author Jeff Rockaway, author of the best-selling book, Second Chance. Welcome, Jeff. Jeff wrote a book about his story, which was read by millions of people. As a result, millions of lives were changed for eternity. The Great Return went on to span three generations. So Pastor Allen's last sermon ended up touching the world. Yes, it did. He must be a governor here as well. No, Pastor Allen's life was too misspent for that. He is one whom God describes as having been saved as though through the fire. Hello. Well, hello. I was just wrapping up our story. Is this the one? Yes. This is Lydia. <gasps> oh, I'm so honored to meet you. Thank you. Lydia, meet Kathy Mingus. The girl I told you about. Kathy Mingus? Oh, yes. You're the very first person to be saved in the Great Return. <laughs> yes, I am. And while Kathy was the first salvation attributed to the Great Return, you, Lydia, are the last. I am? And now you see the connection. Oh. What? Oh, I, I, I don't know what to say. Come. I want you to meet the rest of those who were saved before you. <sighs> they're cheering you, Lydia. And they're thanking God for what he did through a story that changed their eternity. I'm... I'm... Speechless? <sighs> thank you. Oh, and thank you so much for telling me this story. That's my job, and one I happen to enjoy very much. I'll leave you with the others, if you'll excuse me. Yes, of course. Goodbye. Thank you again. I am amazed and so blessed. Goodbye, Lydia. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Wow, those roses look great. Well, thank you. You ready for a little boy time? You bet, Jeff. I'd like nothing better in the world. Thanks, Dad. Hi, I'm John Bevere, author of Rescued. I hope you found this thriller entertaining, but even more, that you heard its very important message. Alan Rockaway never suspected that his life would end on that sunny, calm day. He was still young, strong, and in great health. Alan believed he was in good standing with God. After all, he was the leader of a large church and regularly told people about Jesus in the Bible. But the fact remains, he had failed to address the issues of his own heart and life. He neglected to examine himself. So, let's take a moment and do just that. If you're listening alone, this will be easy. However, if you're part of a group, don't allow the presence of the others to hold you back, because ultimately, we'll each stand alone. Alan was driven by what others thought of him, and it almost cost him all eternity. 
Let those around you fade and focus on your own heart. If you were to stop breathing right now, as Alan did in that submarine, where would you find yourself, heaven or hell? As vivid and horrifying as hell is in our audio theater, our portrayal doesn't compare with hell's reality. It's a place where there's no relief from its torment forever, an eternal realm of utter darkness, loneliness, and hopelessness. And what's even more alarming is that the Bible teaches that hell is where the majority of mankind will end up, not heaven. This was never God's desire, for 2 Peter 2 verse 9 states that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and experience eternal life. So again, where would you find yourself? Would you find yourself in heaven or hell? Well, let's examine your answer in the light of Scripture. If you answered, I hope I'd make it to heaven, or I think I'd make it, that's not good enough. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope or think your way into heaven. In fact, 1 John 5.19 clearly shows that those who are destined for heaven know it. If your answer was, well, I'm not sure, but I do love God, again, you are mistaken. If you truly love God who created the heavens and the earth, you would seek to know what he says in his word rather than just assuming it. So in reality, you've just loved an image of a God you've made up in your own mind. If your answer to this question is, I'm a good person, so yes, I'd make it to heaven, well, again, you're mistaken. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 states, no one is good, not even one. There is a good in the eyes of society, and there is a good in the eyes of God. The two are not one and the same. In fact, Scripture declares, for every person has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. If you answered our question, I was raised as a Christian, attended church, and was even baptized, Again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that being raised in a Christian home saves you from your sins. You now may be questioning, but John, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and someone told me that's enough to get me in. Yes, but did they fail to tell you that the Bible states that even the demons believe and tremble? But demons, let me tell you, are not going to heaven. If we're going to be sure to make it to heaven, we must do it God's way. In the Bible, there was a man named Nicodemus who asked Jesus how to be granted entrance into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus read and memorized scriptures. He sang hymns and was even part of a religious group. But Jesus told him that he must be born again. Now, this term born again has been used so loosely in the past couple of decades that its true meaning has become somewhat diluted. Most people don't even know what it means to be born again. Let me explain. To be born again is a miracle that only God can do inside a person. We are born again when our old nature of sin, which we inherited at birth, dies, and we are recreated in our spirit a brand new person, a child of God. How does this happen? Well, we hear the word of God and we realize our personal sin has separated us from our Creator, and we're deeply sorry. In response, we give all our heart and life to God. We surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ as our supreme master. Why must we do this? To understand, we have to go back to the beginning. God created man in his image, a perfect creation. However, man committed treason against God. He submitted to the wishes of God's arch enemy, Satan. Once this happened, man legally bound himself to the devil and his nature changed. Men and women now would be prone to sin. It is part of our spiritual DNA. The result? Satan's destiny now became ours. Hell wasn't originally created for man, but for Satan and his cohorts. However, Satan has now the legal right to take man to his own fate. But here's the good news. God loved each of us and therefore sent Jesus to save us. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was fathered by the Holy Spirit. So he was all man and all God, and therefore free from the sin that attached itself to the rest of us. He went to the cross as a sinless savior and took our judgment. He was raised from the dead and took his place at the right hand of Almighty God. Now, those who give their hearts and lives completely to him are changed and legally become a child of God. They are born again. In one sense, Alan Rockaway's life parallels millions of men and women 
According to a recent ABC poll, 83% of Americans say they are Christians. Now hold on a minute. I've been to every state in the union. I don't think we can honestly say that 8 out of every 10 people in this nation have given their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ as Lord. So the majority of Americans who say they're Christians are no different than Alan Rockaway. They're deceived. So now comes the moment of truth. After examining yourself, are you deceived as Alan was? In the book of Revelation, Jesus said to a group of people who attended church regularly, I know all things you do, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other, but since you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, let's talk about that. To be hot means you've given yourself to Jesus Christ as supreme master. On the flip side, the person who is cold is one who wants nothing to do with God. But lukewarm, well, it blends. If you're lukewarm, you got enough knowledge of Christianity so that you can blend in with those who are hot. But on the other hand, you have enough cold in you so that you can also blend in with those who are unsaved. You don't stand out. Bottom line, you're not born again, for Jesus will not vomit out those who are truly saved. If you don't know where you stand with God, you can settle it right now. For the Bible says, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. How? Scripture tells us that with the heart, man believes to right standing with God, and with his mouth, confession is made to salvation. So if you believe with all of your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead for your sin, and you're willing to commit your life to his lordship, then let's pray. Repeat these words after me and make sure they come from your heart. God, I come before your throne in the name of Jesus. I realize I'm a sinner. I'm lost and headed for hell. Today, I renounce my self-seeking life, my sin. I completely give my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me, cleanse me with your blood, and change me from this moment on for the rest of my life. I will serve you. Keep me strong to the end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that from your heart, you are now born again and a member of the household of God. You may ask, but John, what if I make a mistake? Well, the sin, which was delightful to you before, will now become far less attractive because your nature has changed. But if you do sin, Scripture tells us that we can go to Jesus and confess and forsake it, and His blood will cleanse us from it. Now, you need to do three things. Number one, talk to God every day. This is prayer, and the way you approach the Father is in Jesus' name. Secondly, obtain a Bible and read it on a regular basis, especially the New Testament. And third, join a church which believes in the Bible as the infallible Word of God. The final two things I'd like to ask you to do is this. First, Scripture shows us that when we give our hearts to Jesus, we must tell somebody about it. Well, would you tell us? You can contact us at messengerinternational.org. Second, resource your life. What does that mean? Get a hold of godly books and godly teaching CDs and listen to them and read them. This was a fictional story based on spiritual truths. To go deeper, I'd love to suggest a book I wrote called Driven by Eternity. It shares these truths plus much more. I'm so excited for you. Today is a day that you will remember throughout all of eternity. And one day, we're all going to celebrate it together in heaven. This has been Rescued, an audio theater from Messenger International, based on the best-selling book by John Bevere. Our cast included Townsend Coleman as Pastor Allen, Michael Yurchak as Jeff, Pat Fraley as Storyteller, Roma Downey as Lydia, Marisol Nichols as Jenny, John Reese Davis as the Voice of God, Scott Mosenson as Pastor Larry, Nancy Travis as Terry, Jim Custer, Perry Denon, Jen Francis, Patricia Bloor, Jim Cummings, Jamie Zimmer, Keith Ferguson, 
Fred Tanishore, and Bruce Nozick. Our executive producer was John Bevere. Our producers were Ellie Bishop and John Fornoff. Associate producer, Bob Hoos. Creative consultant and co-writer, Mark Andrew Olson. Music composed by John Campbell. Our sound design team was Alan Hurley, Gap Digital, Mark Drury, and John Doric. Our recording engineers were Mark Mercado and John Abelardo. Adapted for radio and directed by John Fornoff. This has been a presentation of Messenger International, a ministry of John and Lisa Bevere. You can visit us online at messengerinternational.org or contact one of our offices in the United States, Australia, or the United Kingdom. Rescued Audio Theatre.